essentially what happens is you have to bleed water off of that loop and then make up water in order to keep the solids concentrations at a level that they don't plate out in your heat exchangers. And so this was always a okay. balancing act with the furnaces. Well, welcome everybody uh, back to another episode of Heat Treat Radio. This is gonna be a really cool episode. Pardon the pun, Matt, right off, see there. <laughs> gonna be a great episode. We're gonna be talking about furnace cooling systems, which are perhaps, you know, everybody thinks when they think of furnaces, they think of things being hot. But uh, probably one of the more important things is e keeping the equipment cool, as well as potentially even cooling parts, which is not so much what we'll talk about today. It's not so much part cooling, but it's keeping equipment cool. And sometimes it does help to cool the parts. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And we're going to do so with uh, a cooling expert out of the North American heat treat market, Mr. Matt Reed from Dry Coolers. So Matt, first off, welcome to Heat Treat Radio. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, looking really looking forward to talking with you. Uh, Want to cover some basics just to give our listeners a sense of where we're going. Let's just let me just run down quickly through what I'm hoping that we'll cover today if we have time to do it. Uh, first, we're going to talk just a little bit about you, Matt, and your company, just so people know you know who who you are and how long you've been in the industry and things of that sort. We're going to do a very very high level. Uh, what are cooling systems and why do we need them? Now that, that's it's a very fundamental thing, but there may be some people that need to know that information right off the top. Then we're going to talk about okay, if we if we need to purchase a cooling system, what are the questions we should be asking? So that's that's the that's the next thing hopefully that we'll cover. And then the ever pervasive and always a thorn in our flesh maintenance issues, right? Because yeah. these things are not maintenance free. We're going to talk briefly about that. What are some of the signs that maintenance needs to be done, et cetera? And then finally, if we have time, we will talk about some of the newer developments in, uh, in uh, cooling systems. So that's where we want to go. So let's start off, Matt. Again, welcome. If you don't mind, give our listeners just a sense of who you are, how long you've been in the industry, and why you're qualified to talk about cooling systems. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. So, you know, I have been uh, at Dry Coolers for 28 years. And when you invited me to, to speak about this, I really had to think about it. It says 28 years. Where did that go? I, oh. it's, it's been 28 years. <laughs> and yeah. so by default, I have so much experience that I never knew that I had. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's amazing how quickly it goes. It, it is. So uh, I have been uh, with Dry Coolers for, you know, 28 years and then probably eight years before that, I was at another heat, you know, uh, another corporation, but I've been in heat transfer and design and thermodynamics and dealing with all this, uh, that, that side of the engineering forever. Yeah. And uh, I love it. I love working with the customers. I am the director of uh, sales and technology Got it. and uh, which is a title, but um, really I'm overseeing a lot of the engineering, the design. I'm, the, the, the best part of my job is talking to customers and sorting through, you know, what works for this customer? How can we solve their problems? I thoroughly enjoy it. And Brian and Margie, the owners of dry coolers, allow me to do that. Uh, let's talk just a bit, again, on a very elemental level, all right? Okay. Cooling systems. What are they uh, and right. why do we need them? Right. Yes. So when you started the, this interview, you said, you know, cooling you know it's cool or whatever so yeah it's funny because yeah. dry coolers has a logo you know this is dry coolers keeping it cool for 30 years you know yeah and uh yeah. which we love we've got all kinds of these these shirts that uh everybody here wears but um yeah furnaces is our our core i should say our core market but our first love let's say um you know brian saw an opportunity, saw a problem in the industry and said, hey, you know, I can solve this. And so, so what happened is that, you know, vacuum furnaces, uh, you know, in the 60s, 70s, in this time frame, when they're being developed, they're focused on heat treating materials. Well, cooling is required because you've got these inner wall inner jackets in the furnace, jackets in the heads, you've got diffusion pumps, mechanical pumps, there's all these ancillary pieces of equipment that all require cooling. So originally, you could use city water and flow city water right through the furnace. Yeah. Or, you know, the next, in which, you know, customers soon find out that that's a, a lot of water consumption. And so the next step was to look at an evaporative cooling tower. 
And so you start recirculating evaporative cooling tower water directly through the furnaces. So for those of you that don't know what evaporative cooling tower, <clears throat> not to get into too much of the detail here, but cooling is done by the process of evaporation. So water circulates through this tower on the roof or outside and a small portion of that water is evaporated to produce cooling. So let's say you're flowing 100 gallons a minute through a furnace. 100 gallons a minute goes to that cooling tower and one gallon a minute is evaporated to, re to reject heat. Now you got 99 gallons a minute <laughs> coming back. So now you got to make up one gallon of water from the city water. So you keep recirculating and as water evaporates, it's just like boiling a pot on a stove. You keep boiling that pot, filling it back up, and you're going to end up with calcium. You're going to have scaling on the inside. And this is what's happened to furnaces. You know, it runs great for a couple of years, and then you start getting hot spots. So uh, the old furnaces, a lot of the old furnaces that are out there have had a rough early history because of open tower water. And so you had to be really diligent with your water treatment bleeding water off from the system, adding water treatment chemicals to keep the jackets clean and things like this. And so Brian saw that as an opportunity in 85 and said, hey, let's close it up. Let's take these open water systems and recirculate them in a closed loop and protect these furnaces and stop all the scaling and the buildup and all this stuff. And so that's been <clears throat> our primary job is trying to guide customers into what would be an appropriate closed loop system for you. And so that would apply to old furnaces and to new furnaces. Yeah. 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 So, so, ba so basically the, 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 well, let me ask you this question, the, what parts, and I, I listed some, but what parts primarily on the furnace are we worried about cooling? I mean, I know in a vacuum furnace, we're talking about essentially the entire shell, assuming it's a cold cold wall furnace, right? Meaning it's being it's being cooled, so the entire shell. But other things that 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 typically are cooled. Yeah, yeah. So the shell is your probably the prime. Well, they're all very important, but the shell is a big yeah. user. If you were to you know put 100 gallons a minute into a furnace, a large portion of that water is going to circulate through the jacket. So the furnace has an inner out inner wall and an outer wall and so it's big annulus and so imagine you got two cylinders inside of each other so right. that annulus is full of water and it constantly circulates okay the other pieces of that furnace could be diffusion pump diffusion pump is especially sensitive it's right. uh, it likes to run cool it's got small passages so if there's any flow issues or particles or debris in the system boy that's one of the first places customers have trouble with plugging okay uh, feed throughs um, mechanical pumps these are all other ancillary the, another big user is the quench coil or the 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 uh, the fan so in the vacuum furnace you've got a fan mounted on the back of the furnace or alongside of it and there's a heat exchanger inside the furnace that allows that furnace to quick cool and so we specialize in looking at hey, you've got this size load in a furnace, you need to cool it, you know, it, it, you know, in this period of time in order to create the material properties so we can come alongside a customer and, and, and guide them in selecting a system that would work for that. Right. That's for high pressure gas quenching we're talking about yes. there. Yeah. Right. So those yep. are good. And I know you got, I, I'm assuming you guys do more than vacuum yeah. furnaces. So I know in, in a lot of, um, atmosphere furnaces i say or air furnaces sometimes there's door seals maybe not so much water cooled but sometimes they can be fans can right. be water cooled right. actually cooling jackets for um for a continuous furnace like a belt That's furnace right. if you if yeah. you need if you need a cooling chamber or yeah. cooling zone mm -hmm. so right. again all all potential cooling water so all potential That's cooling right. opportunities right. okay so let's talk about I, i'm sure you've got a lot of people calling you and asking you for you know, systems. Yeah. And it, we don't need to be exhaustive here, but let's just talk about some basics. What are some of the questions that you need answered from a customer who would call in and say, listen, I need a cooling system. I think I need a cooling system. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What do you need to know about my system in order to size the thing or what type even to purchase? Yeah, sure, sure. So flow 
is the first thing that we need to know. And usually the furnace supplier, or there's be some information on what that flow requirement is. And, and yeah. we have a lot of that information here at dry coolers, but we also look at your location. So somebody in Tulsa will need a different cooling system than somebody in, uh, you know, Vermont. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. And so, um, you know, we have, we know, you know, certain parts of the U S LA, for instance, there might be UL requirements There might be it, the, the cooling requirements in one location is much different from another. Some, yeah. um, environmental regulations restrict water usage. So it's just like, you know what, you can't discharge water. You can't have a cooling tower because you're gonna have to haul your water away if you have to discharge anything. So we look at what are our options and there. We usually very often we'll go with a dry cooler. I mean, that's, that's our namesake, which I guess I really haven't talked about, but dry cooling is essentially, you know, in our, our, our version of air cooled heat exchanger with fans and a radiator that ex just exchanges heat directly with the ambient air. And so no water usage, we fill it with glycol for freeze protection and, um, our happiest customers use this kind of a product because it just protects their furnace forever. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, so, so talk about dry yeah. coolers. I, mean, I know you're hitting on it there, but yeah, just talk about yeah. just for a second, what is the namesake? Why do we call it that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny because dry coolers is a cactus, right? If you've ever seen dry yeah. coolers logos at the shows or anything like this, we've got this cactus. And so, and this is, you know, Brian can tell this story, but uh, there was a period of time where he, they lived, he lived down in Arizona and this saguaro cactus, you know, is like, hey, this is a perfect brand label for dry coolers. No, we do not. Our office is not in Arizona. It's north of <laughs> yeah. Detroit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is a cactus logo. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, our uh, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, probably I'm going to say half of our business or, or more in terms of heat treating is cooling using air cooled heat exchangers uh directly cooling the furnaces using glycol water gotcha and uh and 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 so imagine your car radiator filled with glycol you just don't have to worry about the interior of that engine anymore it's right. cooled and so right. this is what we're doing with vacuum furnaces now we have to be careful about temperatures you know if you're in southern texas or I'm, it could be Alaska these days, you know, temperatures get extremely high, your water temperature, your glycol temperature is going to go up. And so we need to address sensitive parts on the furnace, the diffusion pump or feed throughs or whatever, and make right. sure that this solution that we have uh, for this furnace is going to be appropriate. Yeah. But um, yeah, we're, we're, we are very pleased with the development of our air coolers. And I'd like to show you a little bit more about that later. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds good. Um, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about maintenance of these systems because that, that is a, you know, that's a, it's always a sticking point, right? So what, what are the signs, Matt, what are the signs of that your system is probably going to be needing some sort of maintenance? Okay. I want to talk about two different types of cooling. So these are the main types of systems that we build. One is a closed loop evaporative system okay. where we've got the open tower, which originally everybody used, but now we put a plate heat exchanger in between. So now we got a, we got one loop that's for the furnace that is closed. And then we got another loop that's outside for the cooling tower water. Okay. okay. So that's one. The other system I want to talk about is our air cooled system, but let's do the ugly one first. The ugly okay. one is the evaporative system. Okay. So when, uh, you know, so customers, they're, uh, the, the first signs of issues is hot spots on a first furnace, right? Customer knows, you know, an operator knows that, hey, my water temperature is getting high or they're 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 in proximity to something you know what feel the bottom of your furnace feel the upper side of the jackets if you're starting to get heat down below that means you're getting sediment built up in that yeah. furnace and this was very early sign of water tr troubles in a lot of vacuum furnaces and so older furnaces you'll see cutouts in the jackets where it's been cut out so they can get in there rot it out clean it out and then weld it back together right yeah crazy and so yeah, yeah it's, it is it is crazy so hot spots the other, um, uh, for an evaporative tower system, 
with a closed loop, you're generally well protected on the furnace side. So you, what, what, what we've done is essentially we've got a clean loop side for the furnace that circulates water and you have treated water in that side. And so for the most part, once it's treated and started and runs, it's good. There's very little maintenance needed on that side on the furnace. So now the furnace is protected. The cooling tower, however, is exposed to the outside air. It's always scouring the air for any dust, debris. And so the plate heat exchanger gets clogged up. So you start losing temperature. So it could be every year, every few years that heat exchanger has to get plant, uh, cleaned. So customer calls because they're not getting enough cooling, they're getting too warm. More than likely it's the plate heat exchangers losing flow and needs to be cleaned. Now, the other side of the cooling tower is Again, 1% of the water usage of water flow is, is a rule of thumb. 1% of that flow is evaporated um, in the process of evaporation. So you're always making up water, which means you've got to, so to, to keep that water in balance uh, without going into too much detail on water treatment, essentially what happens is you have to bleed water off of that loop and then make up water in order to keep the solids concentrations at a level that they don't plate out in your heat exchangers. And so this was always a okay. balancing act with the furnaces is, hey, how do we, you, you have a water treatment supplier, you really, really need to monitor this stuff. The problem here that we found is that maintenance crews are becoming less and less available or- Yeah, or knowledgeable. Experience. Yeah. That's right. You you yeah. you have you know you, you're you got a lot of attrition, and then all of a sudden people see, hey, how come we're bleeding water off this? This is just wasting money over here. Just shut that valve, you know, and yeah. everything's fine. Just imagine you're you're evaporating one gallon out of every hundred gallons a minute, and so after an hour, you've just evaporated sixty gallons. Okay, yeah. at the end of the day, you've just you know. So it really adds up. And so now you look at it and say, oh my gosh, I've evaporated the entire volume of water in that cooling tower twice a day in order to keep up with the heat cooling requirement. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? And so, boy, you really have to be on it. I mean, in a matter of a few days of turning off that valve, uh, you will start scaling up. You're gonna start seeing crud on the cooling tower. And unfortunately, that all accumulates in the hot spots in the system. So your plate heat exchangers will get fouled up. That's, that's where most of the uh, minerals will drop out is on hot surfaces, warmer surfaces. And worst case would be if you're circulating this water directly through a furnace, those hot spots are on the jackets. And that's why, you know, we see that. So, right. so anyway, yeah, cooling towers um, are kind of necessary for large systems, large water systems. And so let me, this is, this would be my, our internal guide is, hey, if you've got 300 to 500 gallons a minute of cooling required or above, you probably need a cooling tower just because the amount of cooling that's required. And so anything below that, you really should be looking at air cooled. Um, it's just, it's usually more cost effective, smaller footprint, it's excellent for uh, winter use and summer use. It's just the, the way to go. Yeah, as far as maintenance with an air-cooled system. Right, yeah. Um, you know, they're really, there's one thing you gotta do, clean the fins. Yep, once because a year. It, because of things that may fins. be coming just from the air that may be plugging yeah. it up. That's right, it could be cottonwoods, you know, fluff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or yeah, bags or whatever, whatever is in the area <laughs> that wants to get yeah. sucked underneath it. So yeah, we need to either add filters or periodically clean those air coolers. So yeah, with an air-cooled system, usually the, the comment is, hey, I'm getting hot. And so um, that usually means, yeah, the fans or the, the air cooler needs to be cleaned. Is there is the 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 closed loop portion of the air cooled systems is glycol, correct? Okay, so glycol is in the furnace, running around cooling the furnace, comes out, goes through the inside of the air finned where the air is being pulled in or pushed over, however whichever way that air is going, and cools it, cools the glycol, and then back. Okay, uh, is there any? I know with with uh, water systems especially open loop 
ones that are, are not closed, but probably even with closed loop water systems, if there is such a thing, you've got to maintain, you've got to monitor the water. With glycol, any concerns? I mean, how long does the glycol last or is it infinite, ad infinitum? You know, how often do you check the coolant in your car? <laughs> that, Not that's very about, often. <laughs> that's about, you yeah. know, I, I, I would like to say, oh yeah, you need to regularly check this, but you kind of don't. I got you yeah. know, customers that, that, yeah, they fill it up. The glycol now that you purchase will have inhibitors in it. And you can periodically take a sample and have it checked to make sure that it still has the proper amount of inhibitors. Gotcha. So essentially, if you had to add more inhibitor, it's a matter of adding more of this chemical to yeah. the existing glycol. You don't have to pull the glycol out, right? Right. And so um, it's a pretty minor, uh, minor thing. I will tell you though, I've had customers that, you know, 20 year old furnaces that were on glycol that were yeah. purchased by another. So they, they, the company gets sold or the furnace gets sold. The furnace shows up at a new location and it is pristine. That was a glycol system. There was a glycol in that furnace. You look yeah, in there, sure. it's like, oh my gosh, this is clean, yeah. you know, like the day they bought it. That's the beauty of the air-cooled system. Now, the other thing is air-cooled, uh, air coolers are often put on roofs and they're kind of forgotten about. A lot, of, a lot of times it's the last thing to be maintained and that's okay because they really are simple devices. And you know, the fact that they get forgotten about sometimes <laughs> it suggests yeah, yeah. that they don't need a lot of attention. Right. Um, so our, our, our happiest customers, honestly, and I'm not selling you a business here, is, is air-cooled. And, uh, air and we like it for that reason too, is it just, hey, it, we know that it's, it's very robust. If you're needing 300 to 500 gallons yeah. per minute, you're going to yeah. tend towards, or over that, you're going to tend towards a, an evaporative system. So basically, when we're talking about the air-cooled stuff, completely closed loop uh, as yeah. far as the liquid goes that's right. going to be less than 500 gallons per minute less than 300 gallons per minute so we uh, to be clear we have customers that have 1000 gpm systems in their air cooled those okay. customers okay. have you know 10 air coolers in a bank gotcha that, you know, and we do we have customers that oh no no they're strictly air cooled we'll take those 10 air coolers because there's zero maintenance and they're very energy efficient. So our, our, one of the big motivating factors is electricity in some locations in the United States, man, it is very expensive. And so having yeah. all of our air coolers have variable speed fans. And so in the winter time or when it's 40 degrees outside, you might have you know, 24 fans, but only four of them are running, <laughs> right? And they just kind of ramp up and down to regulate temperature, but it's, it's you're directly cooling that glycol with the ambient air. So when it's cool outside, boy, you're just as energy efficient as you can be. It's, uh, it's terrific. On the, on the flip side, if you have an evaporative cooling tower in the winter, you're always running water outside. It's splashing down. You get a little bit of mist coming out that creates icicles. And now you get either rooftops or parking lots with ice on them. It's not uncommon. It, so the cooling tower that you use yeah. needs to have very low drift and things. So we deal with them. I'm just suggesting that. Yes, there's if, more considerations. If, if, if yeah, if you're 300 GPM or less, we're going to look. So even if you're in Mississippi, I'm not not no kidding. I mean, someplace yeah. hot, muggy, whatever. Yes, yeah. let's look at it. We're seeing more and more customers further south using um, our air cooled heat exchangers in these applications just to get away from water usage. Right. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, and uh, it, for uh, captive heat treaters, for manufacturers, let's say who are doing their own in-house heat treat who have maybe a variety of different furnaces. Do you yeah. tend to find that they are using one system per furnace? Or no, are we yeah. typically combining uh, systems and have like a, a building wide cooling right. system How, and what are the considerations there man yeah yeah usually it doesn't start out that way you know customer buys one furnace and then another one or two more and so you end up with these you know oh yeah. we got one here got one here got one here so you end up 
And we have had customers with 10 furnaces and 10 water systems, and it takes up so much floor space. So yeah, yeah, it, you, you get, there's some regret <laughs> on the part of the customers for having to maintain, you know, 10 different cooling systems for these 10 furnaces. So yes, in an ideal world, I, we would definitely be looking at a central system yeah. where you could have, you'd have your built-in redundancy, you would only use as many cooling systems or, or fans as needed, let's say. So yeah, there's so much diversity. So you've got, you know, it, whether a furnaces are running or not, oftentimes the water system is let run An operator will just, it, just leave it run. Yeah. It, it, you know, even if it's out of cycle, well, it might not be fully cooled. We're just going to leave the water running. The mechanical pump, might, I don't even, I don't know why, but so all these systems could be running, but you're not producing. And so that's, really wasting energy. And so yeah. central system allows you to take the entire plant load up and down yeah. more efficiently. And so ideally, I would say, yeah, we would want to look at central systems. And you can control the the output of that central system just the same as you can for an individual system, I assume, always keeping the outlet water at a certain or outlet glycol at a certain temperature, I assume. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I think gotcha. even a little bit better because if you've got 10 furnaces, operators can't load all 10 furnaces at the same time. So they're never in cycle at the same time. And so you right. get this diversity. And so you might have one furnace going into quench. And so a large system really just kind of evens that all out. And so okay. um, it, it, um, yeah, it, it runs pretty efficiently. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, good, good stuff. All right, so I, I've got a couple of questions for you here before we wrap up, uh, Matt, just about some of the latest developments. You know, I mean, we've talked about some considerations when we want to buy new equipment. We talked about some of the maintenance, some basic maintenance things. What are you seeing as far as in new developments in this era? Are there new products, processes, you know, materials that are being used to design these systems or even how they're used? Yes, yes. So um, we're seeing more and more um, air-cooled systems uh, being installed. And, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of this, we're, you know, when, when I started 28 years ago, a lot of them was, you know, evaporative cooling tower, a little bit of air coolers. It was, it was a little bit of both and a little bit more cut and dry. Here you go. But we're seeing more and more customers requiring variable speed drives for pumps. Um, now our default is variable speed drives on all fans. If you buy an air cooler from us, it will have drives that will just ramp up and down to match your load. It's it's really efficient. It is. Um, we're seeing a lot more requests for adiabatic uh, air cooling, where you're using an air cooler, but you're providing a little bit of a mist assist on a hot day to knock the edge off of that. So you get a hundred degree day, turn the misting on. Um, and, and so we're we're seeing this adiabatic cooling. So we're pre-cooling the air before it goes through the air cooler. Right. Um, so and you can only uh, I'm assuming area. you can only do that in some some geographies, right? Because that doesn't work so well in the highly humid uh, that's right. southeast yeah. or wherever you're yes. humid. Right. That's okay, right. gotcha. That's right. Yep. Yep. So yeah, those are that those are the big areas. One thing that I will say too is that, you know. As, as I'm sure you're seeing too, is that there a lot of facilities have less and less maintenance people, and yeah. uh, there's 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 a lot of attrition there, and we're we're um, losing a lot of experience, unfortunately, in maintaining these facilities. And so the past five years, we've been on this development kick on our air coolers, our AVI series air coolers that led to the variable speed fans, and also now leading more and more toward maintenance. And so. We're um, the, the one main area where we see our air coolers needing assistance is in those climates where you've got locations where you've got cottonwoods, where you need filters for the air coolers, and how do you clean them easily? And so we've made some developments on our air cooler that allows us to slide our fan out of the way. You can get a wand down in there to clean out, to spray okay. in some foam uh, detergent to, to clean out the units and stuff. And so there's some features that we're adding to these units to make it easier to main, uh, to maintain, but um, they're pretty easy as it is. I mean, really. This, right. Pretty carefree. <laughs> has the, has the move to um, 
well, let me let me put it this way: has the focus on sustainability and green technologies affected you guys at all? I, I'm thinking primarily: uh, are we seeing more companies moving to vacuum furnaces, and therefore that affect your you know the number of units you guys are putting out? Are you seeing anything in the sustainability area that's impacting your business? I think dry coolers has been perfectly positioned for that, right? I think we've been right, uh, you know environmentally friendly and focused on the environment right out of the gate. The whole closed loop idea with air coolers is um, it falls right in line with minimal um, yeah, minimal emissions, impact on the, uh, minimum right. discharge to your water, to your environment, storm drains, things like this. It's um, yeah. So now I think that we're, we're in a good position there. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from a trend standpoint, and this is something that Brian and I've discussed many times. Brian is is convinced that, it, and it's true, that cooling towers, that people really want to move away from cooling towers. And the choice is yeah. going to be more of you get air cooler or a chiller. And so it's all closed loop. There's no evaporation. There's no water treatment, no discharge and all that stuff. Um, and so this these two pieces, a refrigerant chiller and an air cooler are are the two you know main selections and so we're yeah. seeing a lot more chillers being purchased at the expense of electricity because chillers consume Take more electricity a lot yeah. more electricity and so um air coolers are much more favorable from um uh, energy usage and therefore yeah. in, environmentally so we're seeing combinations where we use a chiller in the summer during the heat but we'll use an air cooler the rest of the year so what we've called it we call it a hybrid system where boy a customer really has to have 85 degrees but they only want to use uh, a closed loop air cooled system with glycol okay air cooler 90 percent of the year and here's a chiller for a small portion of the year to take the edge off of the heat zero water discharge so we're able to be creative like that and work with the customer's footprint their location and and um yeah. Are you seeing any, uh, let's say, closed loop monitoring of equipment? Like, oh on, my gosh. for example, on your fans, fan vibration yeah. on your air cooling right. systems. Right. Uh, are you seeing any of that going on as far as right. helping with maintenance? Sure. So um, I will tell you, we're seeing a lot of requests for Link IO. And I know that's a very specific term, but this is where we take yep. our instrumentation off of our cooling system and we tie it into this central link or uh, Ethernet hub. There's no PLC, there's no HMI, but now we've got temperatures, pressures, flow, level, whatever critical measurements yeah. customer wants, and boom, here it is. Now they can take it directly back to their building management system. Yeah. And so I'm floored by how many customers want that and they they just buy it. It's, it's, it's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's a much easier solution for us to provide than a full-blown PLC or custom PLC for every customer. So every customer is a little different. This building yeah. management system, Siemens, this one's compact logics or whatever, you know, you're dealing, you're dealing with all these different uh, uh, networks and things. So I'm fortunate enough to not have to get into that nitty gritty. I have got yeah. an awesome team of, uh, yeah, I, I dry coolers. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. and I didn't mention it, but we've got sixty-five employees now. When I started, there was five of us, and I've got yeah. I've got nine engineers. I've got I don't know how, so many designers, electricians. So and it's just fun. It, yeah, it, it really is. I got so many experts in all these different spots that are liking yeah. what they do. It just makes the day go by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. So. Well, let's let's wrap up and let's let me ask you to talk if you want to. And again, maybe yeah. you've already done mm -hmm. this, but if you want to, do you want to talk a little bit just about dry coolers and and you know, <clears throat> kind of a plug there? Okay. Um yes, and I think what I, I, I think we've had a really good conversation. And so I hope you can kind of piece this all together what you want to right. do. What I'd like to do is grab Gary Berwick and run outside here, it'll take two minutes and I wanna show you an air cooler. You can decide whether you wanna put this in it or not. Okay. But what I wanna do is show you, this is a tip that I wanna show customers 
do it on how to do check, it. how to check their air coolers to see if they're plugged. It's a real easy way. Let's do yeah, it. If you don't mind. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, yeah. Cool. Run with it. As long Thank as you, you still got internet connection. Absolutely. Yeah, this will be good. We're taking a field trip, everybody. Doug, I wanted to show you our air cooled heat exchanger. There's some really helpful tips for one of your uh, commercial heat treaters. If they're walking around the unit, trying to find out if it's clean, how it's working, there's some easy things that you can do. And here's what I'd like to share with your audience. If an air cooler, if the fans are working well, that air is coming straight up and out. If it's dirty, if the thin surface is dirty and it's having a hard time moving air, that air is gonna to wanna to push out to the side. Now, it's, this is uh, the new, it's a Zeal Abeg fan, but it's a, has a much higher Venturi on it. So you don't get as much of the outflowing as you do on our legacy unit. We have a lot of customers with a different style fan. Boy, that air will really push out to the side if your coil is dirty. Now, it's not easy to crawl underneath there and check your fins. And it might look like the fins are clean and your guy might have said, yeah, it's clean. I just cleaned the air cooler. But I'm telling you, if your air is pushing out the side like this, <laughs> it's still dirty. Okay, so now what do you do if it's dirty? So we have a bulletin that we can uh, send to you, but here's the short version of it. For this air cooler, you'd unbolt these bolts on this fan and you would prop it up with a four x four or something so that you can get underneath it. And you can blow out with air or a gentle spray of water, or you can use, uh, it's a, there's different refrigerant or evaporator foaming um, solutions. You can spray with a wand in there and the foam will push out any dust and debris, cottonwoods or whatever that's been sucked into it. It makes a huge difference. You want the air cooler to run as close to ambient as you can. If it's dirty, you're wasting energy. It's way better for your process to run it cool as possible. Okay, so let's check one other thing. That's the air cooler. Compared to a cooling tower, <laughs> That's like nothing, very, very little maintenance. These are usually sitting on a roof and you kind of forget that they're up there and running. But they do get dirty, they have to be checked. So here's the other thing. These are the inlets. Now this is a new unit, of course, this would all be hooked up to your process. So your inlet is on the top, header going in, and your outlet is on the bottom. You should be able to put your hands on here and feel a difference. Should be warm coming in and cool coming out and the thing you want to look at is if you're 60 degrees outside, you should be able to make 70 degrees coming out of this process. If it's really warm, that's another indicator that you've got a dirty heat exchanger coil. So we usually size these, design these so that you can get within five to 10 degrees of whatever the ambient is. So again, if it's 90 outside, you should be getting 95 to 100 degrees feeding your equipment. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode with Matt Reed. Give Heat Treat Radio a five-star review or a like on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Podbean, or the website www.heattreattoday.com forward slash radio. If you'd like to get in contact with Matt, email matt.reed, R-E-E-D, at drycoolers.com or reach out to me and I can put you in touch. My email is bethany at heattreattoday.com. Do you have a new or interesting idea that you want to hear discussed on Heat Treat Radio? If so, let me know. Also, if you'd like to sponsor a future episode, let me know at bethany at heattreattoday.com. Now, celebrate this 100th episode with us while you listen to Doug reflect on his past seven years of Heat Treat Radio leadership. So, Doug, we come to our 100th episode. Big, big uh, milestone for Heat Treat Today and Heat Treat Radio. Um, yes. What... Over the last couple of years, I mean, we started this back in 2016 before I was part of Heat Treat Today. What has been the most popular yeah. episode over this whole uh, f f seven years now? Yeah, it's pretty amazing that we're, we've got 100 episodes. It's, it's hard to believe. And I want to first thing I want to do is just thank you, Bethany, for all the work you've done on these. You've you've kind of taken these and uh, and have run with them, made them much easier for us to do. And they're much better in quality now that you're doing them than when we first started, there have been a lot of very popular episodes. Probably the one I I remember the most is uh, that I that I believe is the most popular was the one with John Hubbard that we did at the time when John was coming back into the industry. He was a former 
CEO of Body Coat, left the industry for a while, decided to come back, uh, work with a company out of the Baltimore area. And mm. that one was, I think that was early on. I think it was like episode number seven or something like that. It was, oh. it was early, but uh, that was, that was very, that was a very popular one. Can I tell you one of my favorite ones? Sure. Yes, please go ahead. I mean, they're all, they're all in one sense my favorites, but we got to do one with Mark Mills, who is from the Manhattan Institute on the energy future, which was just very, if, uh, and I promoted his, actually his podcast. He's got a podcast of his own called The Last Optimist. And I promoted that uh, podcast, but very interesting guy and very, very interesting perspective. Uh, so that was, that was one of my outside industry outsiders. Uh, Mark was, that was one of my, one of my favorite ones. It was interesting. Likewise. But for those who know you, that shouldn't come to a big surprise with the energy and the economics that we covered in that episode. Yeah. yeah. Quite fascinating right. for anybody, but I think especially for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. He's, he's, he's a guy that is, is, promoting a very unpopular perspective you know it's not doesn't keep up with the corporate corporate uh corporate line these days about the energy future of the united states so it, it's worth worth listening to we started when we started heat Treat radio we were one of the very few that actually doing video and or audio in the in the in the marketplace and where we are probably the most consistent i mean we've got 100 episodes right and we've done that over over seven years so we've been pretty consistent. So the numbers, it's interesting. When we first started, the numbers weren't all that great. But, you know, I, from the stats that actually you were so kind to put together, we've got over, uh, over the life cycle, we've got 23, over 23,000 people who are 23,000 listens. Obviously, I don't know how many people that is, but we've got 23,000, uh, over 23,000 listens to our episodes. So it's it's growing steadily. Again, you know, podcasts are in the industrial sector are not going to be like the Joe Rogan show, you know. But they're for what we've got, it's it's pretty good. I mean, we've got we've got pretty good listenership. So yeah, from when I was, I was just looking at it briefly myself, and it looks like from twenty, it's only been increasing over the years, and most of those listens are coming from 2021, 2022 and definitely yeah. 2023, although we're only halfway through. So yeah. it's exciting to watch that growth. Um, it is. And you know what, the, the, you, you uh, in preparing for this little conversation, we were talking about just the geography of mm -hmm. where these things are coming from. I thought it would be heavily US, which it, I think it is. I mean, we've got what, 17,000, almost 18,000. And this is only on SoundCloud. And this is only for the audio only versions of the podcast. Yes almost 18,000 people have listened on just in the US. And then we've got, you know, another thousand in in uh, Mexico and Canada combined. But you've got, we've got people from Germany, the UK, India, Japan, South Africa, Brazil, Australia, all listening, right? And that's not the videos, correct? Isn't that what we said? It wasn't videos, right. it's just the it's just the audios. So it's, yeah. It's yeah, kind, I'm not it's kind of worldwide. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I haven't done the stats on the video, but those also seem to draw an even more international audience than this the audio does. Um, mm. So that's quite interesting and great that we're able to to help people across borders, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, as you think about heat treat reading, what we've been able to do again, it's highly technical or try to be more technical and just show those updates that are useful for making decisions in the industry. Why is heat treat radio um, so important for North American heat treat in particular? Yeah, I think it, 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 the, the point of the heat treat radio, one of, the, one of the things we're trying to do at heat treat today is provide timely, helpful, technical information in a way that the modern day consumer consumes them. Now, a lot of people will think that's all digital. Everything's digital, right? Well, the fact of the matter is that's completely untrue. The facts are are very much against that i mean a lot of uh, most people ask for a print publication mm -hmm. not even a digital publication but actually a print publication mm -hmm. but there are some people who consume uh digitally and in the digital world there's a variety of different things it can be e-news e-newsletters can be websites things of that sort but some do enjoy podcasts some mm -hmm. enjoy podcasts whether they be just audio podcasts or video so mm -hmm. 
We're trying to present that timely, good technical information in a way that's helpful to people. And it, it by means of a podcast and a video podcast as well, which we started, I think, second quarter of last year or so, 2022, uh, mm-hmm. has been has been really helpful. So we hear from a lot of people. Uh, it's amazing to me the number of people we hear from say, oh, you do the radio thing. Yes, yes, we do. Yeah. So it's <laughs> I think it's helpful to deliver that information in, in, a, in a way that's uh, that's helpful, and meaningful to our audience. That's great. Any plans for the future of this podcast then? Bigger and better. We're, we continue to grow. It's uh, uh, it's important we continue to try to find good technical content. It's it's as you know, being the editor of these things, Bethany. You know you know the struggle that it is uh, trying to find good content. Uh, so that's what we want to continue to try to do is is continue to find good technical content and sometimes just human interest content about the industry. Uh, mm-hmm. We just continue to, to keep on keeping on. We're, we're, uh, we, we have made the commitment to video as well as audio. So we're going continue to continue to do that uh, and hopefully help it be a, be a, uh, be a help to the, the people in the industry. So more, more of the same. Nice. Well, that's good to hear. Good to hear from my perspective as well. But um, <laughs> I know you enjoy them. Uh, so question for you. What do you like most about putting these things together? Oh man, you know, I, I don't know how many times I watch each interview before from original raw audio yeah. to its final completion. So being able to see and hear all of this new content over and over again, it's, it's an education for me, but it's also quite interesting to see just the quality of individuals that come through our North American yeah. treat industry what they're offering, yeah. the diversity that they're offering in terms of uh, the technology and their insights and knowledge and their personalities. It's just great to get to yeah. know people. Um, and I probably know some folks better than they know me at this rate. So I think that's what I like <laughs> a, a bunch. <laughs> right, all right. Well, yeah, as I said, you do a great job on it. We appreciate the effort you put into it, Bethany. Oh, well, thanks, Doug. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for listening. We'll, we'll close out the episode in a second. This and every other episode of Heat Treat Radio is the sole property of Heat Treat Today and may not be reproduced in part or in whole without advanced written permission from Heat Treat Today. And I'm Bethany Leone. Thank you for listening. Thank you.